Yeah, well, um, I definitely never thought I would ever be a climber. I'm terrified of heights. I still have a hard time with it. Uh, my first climbing time that I did when I was uh, growing up in, in high school, we went to a climbing class and it was no problem going up, but there was no way in hell that anyone was going to let me to get me to let go of that wall. Like yeah. I was locked on and didn't want to lower. Actually, there happened to be a ladder right beside me. I went down the ladder, <laughs> went to the locker room. I went, apparently, I was white as a ghost. I, I was terrified. And then um, probably about, I don't know, maybe eight years later, I was working in a fitness facility in uh, Calgary, and they came up to me and said, hey, we just bought a climbing wall, and you're the climbing manager. And I hadn't climbed since. So um, I had to learn to do everything. So manage that business, and also I was going to be teaching the instruction, and I had to do it. And it wasn't that I didn't like climbing. I just didn't like going up high, um, and I didn't trust the systems and all that. So from there, I started climbing. So I, was, I started as an indoor climber, not out here in the mountains. And, of course, once you get into it in the community, like, you know, uh, it's pretty small usually. There's a few gyms around. Everyone starts getting to know each other and then started climbing outside. So I've always been more of a sport climber. Um, nothing in trad. Uh, bouldering and sport are pretty much the main things. A little bit of multi-pitch. Uh, out here we do have some good multi-pitch, so I've been on some of those. And now that I'm older, have a family, uh, you know, working with the national team, I find my time is a lot more limited. So I end up spending a lot of time in the gym, uh, climbing, way more climbing in the gym than I do outside. And I think because of that, my body is gets wrecked more. <laughs> I think outside, you you don't you never go as hard outside consistently as you can inside. And I find that, you know, I had uh, finger injuries or have had finger injuries, a shoulder, a little bit, you know, tweaks in that too. I find that indoor climbing, I have to be way more aware of my warm up and my um, preparations before I climb and all the things that I do after or else I just, I just get, um, yeah, I get wrecked. <laughs> and so outside, think, it's yeah, way easier. You, you know, I, get, I think sure. you don't, uh, oh, sorry. You, you, so you, outside, you you just, you know, it's a walk in here with lots of hikes in. And so you, you get warmed up that way. You do some easy climbs. You do your hard things. You walk out. You do three or four, you know, out long sport routes. It doesn't seem nearly as bad as doing inside where it's just, you know, attempt after attempt after attempt, especially bouldering. So you basically, you've kind of, you've experienced where you have... Uh, way more attempts, way more burns on your on the routes, mm -hmm. and then you don't really have that cardiovascular warm up from doing this really long approach, and so you have to be almost more vigilant about your warm up and and taking care of your body. Yeah, it's, indoors I have to worry about it more. Outside I can walk, you know, we'll hike in. I'll usually take a longer hike because I like to hike, um, and I'll do my warm up things in outside. But you're, I think it's just a less attempts. You know, you do a thirty meter sport route and you know the next person has to do it so there's lots of rest in between that and you just I just have you have more rest outside I think than you do inside where here you know you do a burn on a boulder problem you can do 10 in you know 10 minutes and it just seems like I I break down a little bit more there so I just have to be aware you know way more aware inside than I am outside outside is I, I just find that I I don't know I just find it easier outside got it to uh to not get hurt. <laughs> yeah, and have you had, you mentioned finger and shoulder, have you had any, you know, any of those injuries and how have you dealt with them or, you know, how have you... Yes, yeah. yeah, so fingers, I mean, I think, like I have a, my right pinky is completely, like it'll never be straight again, I dislocated it from a, a pocket, you know, doing a dynamic move where my hand was, my right hand was in a pocket and it just was so far to the next hold that I dislocated the pinky and it popped back in oh, wow. and then all the scar tissue was built up and now I've gotten it as straight as I can but it doesn't hurt or anything like that it just looks crooked <laughs> you know it get, I get joint pain I've had a pulley injury on my right on my left ring finger from indoor I, I don't I have never had a finger injury outside in all the years I've climbed outside it's always oh, wow. been on inside training and that um, shoulder, I broke a collarbone playing hockey, and it doesn't really help your climbing too much. My arm's a little 
shorter <laughs> because uh, my uh, my collarbone's crossed now. Um, you know, stuff like that. Got it. So, and we'll talk a little bit later to how some of these injuries kind of have affected how you coach and how you sure. kind of work with your athletes. But tell me sure. a little bit as well about how your involvement now in Canadian climbing and with the youth programs. Yeah, so I started, this was got 20 years ago, I started coaching. Um, we got the well going and uh, we did youth programs, learned that there was a youth circuit that was very new in Canada, started hosting some competitions, realized that um, I like coaching. I've always been, I played hockey until I was 16 or 17 years old uh, at, uh, you know, pretty high level and was always involved in uh, track and cross country running and skiing and every other sport, swimming and that too. So I always knew I would want to be involved in athletics of some sport. I just never knew it would be climbing. Um, I found that in our circuit in Canada, they had coaches and they had the gyms, but they had no judges. So I went and got my international judging certification so I could be a head judge for Canadian nationals. Oh, wow. Um, started that and then really coached at the same time, but I was kind of doing both. And then when I moved out to Banff here in 2001, I, I knew I, I, couldn't, I couldn't handle both anymore. If I really wanted to be a good coach, I had to focus on coaching. And that's when I started going to coaching conferences that there was nothing on climbing, but it was still, you know, sports psychology or a periodization models or long-term athletic development or whatever that I could take and apply to climbing. And I'm probably, I'm a little older than you, but all the books, you know, you read all the books from Eric Hurst and Performance Climbing with Dale oh, Goddard and all these ones, you know, and none of them are for youth. Um, so I spent a lot of years probably not programming right for youth because I just adapted what I was doing for myself to them and then realized from watching the kids that uh, this wasn't good. They, they weren't able to do certain things. Uh, not a lot of real injuries at the start, but as we got more and more serious, kids would push themselves more. The exercises really had to be adjusted for what the kids were able to do. And this longer term athletic development plan that started in Canada was key for me to really look at what was appropriate for kids at, you know, a female at 12 that's going through puberty. What can we do? What can we, what should we do? I started realizing that results, our, our sport was super results oriented and I wanted to be more performance orientated so that meant that the results had to take a back seat to what was appropriate for the kids at their stage of development and explaining that to the parents and to the kids and having them agree and understand was pretty difficult but I think I've been doing it long enough now that the you know it's kind of way more accepted uh, and easier to go to these parents now and just say you know that like this kid's not ready for this and we shouldn't be pushing them and they had a great performance but the result wasn't good doesn't mean they they, they climbed poorly you know there was a lot way different ways of looking at how a kid climbed in a competition um you know knowing they just came out of a big growth spurt or you know they be gone over the summer and a guy you know 16 year old boy comes back and he's seven inches taller than when he left me the you know two months ago you know it was real eye-opening for these kind of things. So I think that's where all the development of our youth program has really come for me with the national team is getting a real clear understanding of where these kids are currently in their developmental age and where their goals are and seeing if that actually matches up because there's a lot of education that needed to happen to some kids where we just say, you know, you, you might have to push that back a little bit. Or you may not, you know, but... Don't be surprised if you can't do what you think you need, you, th you want to do just because it's not your fault. It's not because you're not working hard enough. You're just 13 year old boy and you got to wait. And uh, I think that education is huge for our youth coaches. Just because they're getting injured, you know, kids will get injured if they keep pushing. And then we then we've lost them. Then our development programs aren't developing athletes anymore. We're just getting injured athletes and, that doesn't help anyone. And that's great how you mentioned too that you, you're you looking at the long-term development. You're not just looking at this snapshot in time, which is results-based, like most, most coaches and, and young kids would approach or, or look at things. 
It's a tough balance because when you're on the national team, um, results are important. You know, you get selected for the national team because of your results at the national championships. So your top three or, you know, your coach's selection. So that's, that's based on results there. So it's hard to take them completely out because our sport is results oriented. But we have to balance that with, you know, other reasons for going to these camps. And we have young kids, 14 years old, that are going to ARCO last year for the very first time. They've never been to an international competition. The first one they go to is in Europe, which is always bigger than any other event. 750 competitors, a whole town that shuts down for this. Oh, wow. Huge walls that they've never seen before. The top climbers in the world. And then we expect them to perform. <laughs> and, you know... Because they're the top in Canada, which doesn't really mean a lot, you know. Like our our depth isn't big enough yet for them to kind of go and do this and say, yeah, you know, I won Canadian championship, but you do find it worlds. So it's a big eye opening experience, and the preparation for them is not to say, you know, don't worry about your performance at all. You know, do the best you can, but just realize that this isn't this isn't what you're used to. This is another level. And competing in international events is so such a big step for our climbers in Canada that you almost have to give them that one year to be overwhelmed and mm -hmm. then they understand what they need to do and then next year they can make the decision, okay, I'm ready, I, I know what to expect. It's tough though. Yeah, very interesting. So it's you mentioned earlier too about the, a long-term plan that, like for Canadian climbers. Mm -hmm. Is this we had, you're talking for? Is this the pillars that you're speaking of when when we talk? Before? Yeah, so that, yeah, so that's a component of it. So what we're looking to do in, in Canada is um, not go from year to year without you know a year finishes and then we don't actually have any continuation. The next year starts. So one year finishes, next year starts, and there isn't any continuity between the plan. And partly that is because um, the terms for my coaching position, whoever happens to be in it, are year to year. So I'm pushing for a four-year term for whoever is in the head coach. I hope it's me, but whoever's in there because uh, it's we need to plan development over a longer period of time. The pillars come in as recognition of here's four pillars of, of uh, competition ability that you need to be aware of when you're training. So they're the physical... Uh, technical skills, tactical skills, and psychological skills are the four pillars that we use. And the idea is is that um, it comes out of seeing the kids crush and training and do well at nationals and then totally bomb at, at Worlds. So we know they're strong, but they can't, they're not strong at the Worlds. And so we spent a bunch of years figuring out why. And we found that they're very physical very good physically and technically, or generally pretty good in those areas. Not much different than any of the other kids, but their tactical abilities and their psychological abilities were way, way worse. And so this has to come from not, not the national team, because we don't get them until after the national championships, and we have a short period of time. My work is now going down to the club level with the coaches, conference that we have, and, and going around the country and explaining to the club coaches that, you can get your kids as strong as you want and they can hold on to anything and they can dino to anything, but if they're too stressed or they're um, overwhelmed or they're completely uh, you know, scared when they walk out or they're too overconfident, we don't deal with the mental side and the strategies in there, it won't matter how what they can hang on to. They're, they're not going to be able to perform. And so the club coaches have to start putting this into their to the programs. And one of the big topics we had... Uh, which you weren't uh, there for the first uh, morning, was on these integrated support teams that a lot of Canadian uh, Olympic teams have. So it would be uh, a coaching staff, but it would also be incorporating a sports psychologist, a physiotherapist, a dietitian, uh, a strength coach, whatever it is. And not necessarily that all clubs have to have that, but understand that the physical side is just one part. The psychological, you might need to bring in someone to help you with that. You might need to, you know, do some kind of partnership with a physiotherapy clinic or a physical therapist to be able to come in and work on the athlete's uh, mobility or injury prevention or whatever it turns out to be. 
And then once we get that established at that club level, when they come up to the national team, I don't have to teach them strategies. I don't have to work as hard as we do now on the psychological side. And they're, they're, they're more prepared to take that next step. And we, and at the national team, we can just fine tune them and give them the, you know, the, the next level there. So that's, that's my goal for that. And, you know, it's just a small goal, right? Yeah, it's it's a small goal, but uh, when, <laughs> when applied, I mean, can lead to really big results. But do you know of, and I'm not sure of this either, but do you know outside of Canada, you know, maybe in the United States or, or in Europe, um, if at the club level, if it's more common or routine to have uh, access to all those services, or yeah. is this something that you're looking to develop that hasn't um, been widespread in its use yet? You know, I think it's not widespread in North America, but I think that the uh, Asian and European countries are way ahead on this. And I don't know about sports psychology, but every team has a traveling physiotherapist or massage therapist with them, youth and open. For Euro Europe. European and Asian teams? Yeah, more so there. So, I mean, it has to do with dollars. We brought our, uh, the sports psychologist who was at the conference to New Caledonia, you know, the most expensive trip possible, the furthest away, and she came and she was amazing. She worked with our athletes in training camp. She worked with the coaches. Uh, she was there at the competition. She got to see everything. We just can't afford to do that all the time, right? Like sports psychology is eight, nine hundred dollars a day, and she volunteered her time more as a professional development um, opportunity for herself than and to help us. I mean, she's a friend of mine or became a friend of mine, um, but we can't afford to do that. Other countries like Austria. They're federally funded based on their results. They have a good year. They're going to um, be able to have more support staff, especially when it is in Europe. So they don't. their travel costs are way down. Um, they can bring all their top athletes and all their top coaches and uh, support staff with them. When they go to Canada or New Caledonia, you know, money is a factor. They can't bring everyone, but at least they have that throughout the year to get in here. I see. So, kind of want to shift gears a little bit and yeah. kind of now understanding, now I have a good kind of grasp of kind of the goals of development of youth climbing in Canada and what everyone's kind of doing international that kind of leads to good successes at the competition levels. But what have you kind of learned personally with working with your athletes? And maybe even let's just start from the beginning. You know, right off the bat, working with climbers and coaching, when you adopted some of the methods that you know that you wouldn't necessarily use with youths, what were some of the common mistakes that you learned and corrected early on? I think the I think the biggest thing with the difference with working with adults and youth was the intensity of the exercises that we were putting the kids through at the start. So. There was no real progression. The kids, uh, and you know, a lot of these books, uh, you know, How to Climb 512 by Eric Hurst and all that, assumes that you can climb 511 and 510, right? Or you're at that stage, so you have a, a basic ability to climb, you have a base of skills to, to, to draw from, and you're just trying to take that next step to become a 512 climber. What a lot of people would do is look at those programs and just bring them straight down to the to the youth and without any kind of progression. So that was the biggest thing is, sure, I want my kids to have finger strength, but I can't start them campusing. But I can get them on a campus board with their feet on. Or I can just find small holds on a route, and they can just go up and down on small holds. They're still getting finger strength, but they're not doing full body weight off them. And I think that was a, that's the biggest thing for my training is trying to find out where the athlete is and their, their development of their bodies, but also how long they've been in the sport. We have people that are come into the sport 15 to 16 years old from around this area that you are biathletes, for example. So they're strong. You look at these kids, they look muscular. And we wouldn't, we wouldn't adapt their, their uh, training to what their climbing age was, which was zero at that time, right? So... Looking at a muscular chair of a, of a guy, 16 year old boy who's been a biathlete, a cross, full time cross country skier, and all that, too, you would expect that they can handle a lot of things, but their fingers weren't used to it. The sport was completely different. So it was kind of determining all these progressions 
and and so determine the progressions, and then you have to identify the athletes that are and where they are in those progressions, which was always a little difficult as well too. So how do you manage that on the team level? Because it's you have all these individuals at varying chronological age, varying climbing age, and then they have all these unique attributes, but you still need to structure a team practice. Yeah, it's not it's not easy. <laughs> it's a lot of work. There's so much work involved in. I think when people are looking at um, doing a team, they think, especially young coaches when they come in, they think that the coaching is, you know, maybe 15 minutes before practice starts, 30 minutes at the end, maybe talk to parents and kids, and then they're done. So the biggest thing that I learned is coaching is never just the amount of practice times we have. (laughs) It was a lot of planning. And so you would have to look at an exercise that a kid did. And a lot of times we would just start them off with general volume climbing. And from there, you can start seeing, okay, you know, this kid's shying away from this angle. This kid's shying away from this kind of holes. This one only can dyno but can't do anything with their feet. You identify each of these athletes. A lot of the drills afterwards can be split up into groups. Not necessarily everyone has the same weakness, but you've got to work on everything anyways. And then that coordination within a busy gym is the trick. So it's, um, I think there's so much time in coaching. I, I spent a lot of time uh, writing notes or going before practice or talking with the other coaches and say, okay, what are we going to do here? We're doing this phase of our periodization. It's strength or whatever it turns out to be. This case is not quite ready because he was injured and he missed the first two weeks of volume. We need to extend him a little bit longer or, you know, cut him into the, to the strength phase a little bit later, he's going to have to do some things on his own. Um, and the kids that are motivated and understand it and get, get the direction, they're fine. It's the, the, the hardest age, I think, are, you know, those 13 and under, because they, don't, they won't do what you say. Not because they don't want to. They just don't have the focus or the ability to do it. That requires, I think I really think our top coaches in, in Canada – spend all their time with the top athletes where they don't, the top athletes don't need those top coaches anymore. The top coaches need to work with the most developmental stage kids possible so that these kids will progress through all the other uh, age uh, categories that they're going through with a solid base of technique, footwork, all this kind of stuff. So, you know, again, with the club coaches, it seems that the top coaches only work with the top athletes and that's, they don't need that. So how, how do you tag those athletes that need the help? Or how do you identify those that uh, are going to be the best ones to develop or need the most help to develop? Uh, you know, I think it's a lot of observation. And, I, you know, I, I guess I find it hard to explain. I think it's uh, – I've been doing this for 20 years now. So I think at, at some point you just kind of look at a kid and go, okay, you know, this kid's super strong but they're strong because they don't use their feet. And so, you know, you can, you can see that. Um, and, and identify the things in there too. You know, I think there's a feel, a lot of times it's talking with the kids, you know, like the kids usually, uh, there was a, uh, Mike was talking about maybe not going too direct with the, your look at objectives and goal setting and weaknesses and strength and all that. I've never had a problem with that. I've always said, okay, guys, weakness day. What are we working on today? What do you need to work on? The older kids know I need to go on slab. I need to go on overhangs. I need to go on overhangs with sloping holds. I need to work on this. Because they've been through the years of understanding what their bodies can and cannot do. I would rather, much rather have our kids leave our team with the knowledge of how to set up a training program once they leave us on their own and not to rely on me to do it for them all the time. So we include the athletes as when they get older, and here's what we're doing, and here's why we're doing it. And here's the phase, and they'll go, I don't think we need this, and we talk back and forth, and we come to some kind of agreement. Sometimes I have to say, you know what, I'm going to say no, you can't do that, or no, you can't go to this competition because you're injured, or all this kind of stuff. But most of the time, it's a collaboration with the athletes as they get older to understand that, you know, they can do this as well. Nothing that I do or any other coach's magic is all out there. It's all science. It's a piece of cake. 
It's just putting it together. And when they go to university and they leave here, a lot of kids in the past have come, you know, come back. I have no idea what I'm doing. You know, I want to keep training. I want to keep competing, but I don't know how to do that. And that's a mistake. I think the kids need to leave with a lot of knowledge that they can do it on their own. Not that they can't call us. You know, I have kids that started with me when they were nine years old, 14 years ago, and they still email me and call me every once in a while and get an opinion. But it's that partnership and collaboration that I think is really key. Yeah, that's well put. And that's really, I mean, that's the focus of developing lifelong climbers versus just climbers that are going to climb well under instruction in, in the yeah, moment. Yeah. And that's, a, I think, a lot of people in, in, I don't know what's like down in the States, but there's so many kids that uh, get so tunnel visioned on competition climbing that they can't do anything other than that. Or once they're, competition climbing is done, they don't know how to transition into not being a competition climber. And I think that's wrong. I think a lot of kids join climbing first off, not to be competition climbers because they love climbing. And a lot of times we kill it out of them. We kill that passion out of them <laughs> by training them to, for whatever, for our own egos or because they're driven or their parents want them to go in there. And that lo- love of the sport that, that I still have and, and that it's it's driven so far out of them they don't want anything to do with climbing a lot of times they'll come back eventually i think that's wrong you know like i i want strong kids i sure do i want to say i'm on the national team and i have a bunch of kids that make finals at Wells? absolutely i wouldn't want anything different than that but it's because that's their goal you know that the kids come out and say i want to be the best in there it's not my it's not my goal Right. They they need to tell me what to go. Some kid comes up and says, "Hey, I want to go to Worlds one time." I had a kid here in Banff that said, "My goal is to make Worlds team, the national team once. I want to go to a Worlds in another country, and then I'm done." And she did, made it one year. Next year, she was done. Did, oh, wow. She trained with us, but she didn't want to compete anymore. Huh. That's fine, you know. She still comes. She still likes it, and all that. She got to carry the flag for Canada. She she did everything she wanted to do, and that was it. And. Uh, you know, I think we got to respect that. There's not every kid that comes to our club who wants to compete and uh, be the top climbers. So, yeah, so just to understand that it's it's listening to what the kids' goals are and then being able to adapt your mm-hmm. training if you can or just your yeah. your bigger picture thoughts. to, to well, the, the kids want to be strong. They want to be as strong as possible. They work just as hard. They just don't want to compete, whether that stresses them out too much or they just don't like the environment or they prefer to you know just be outside i think injuries happen more when the goals of the athlete and the coaches aren't aren't aligned or they're not understood and now you're pushing an athlete to do something that they may not necessarily want some kids don't can't say it right they they, they won't because they think well this is what i'm supposed to do he's the coach you know and i'm on the team and I think without that open relationship, uh, you know, that has to be developed. You know, I can't, I can't walk into someone else's team and completely understand what this kid is going through from a one-hour meeting where that coach that's working for them for years will be better. It doesn't matter if I'm a national team head coach or not. I'm not going to work. I'm not going to do anything with a kid that doesn't trust me or understand that, um, you know, I'm trying to be there for their goodness. How do they know anything about me? There's a bunch of people uh, that say, well, you're the national team head coach. So apparently I know more um, about athletes than other ones because they're not national team head coach. And it's wrong. Not in climbing anyways. You know, like a kid that's worked with a coach for years, that coach will know that kid way more than I will because that's the relationship they've built up. So I'm going to go to this team in Newfoundland. I'm going to do some clinics, and I guarantee you that they're going to hear exactly the same things that their coach tell them all the time. They're just going to hear it from me, and that might just carry more weight just because of <laughs> a position that I have. There's no magic tricks in training, and uh, you know I think I think a lot of um, you know a lot of kids. I don't know. They just they don't question enough their coaches and uh, maybe that's instilled in sports you just don't question your coach i think you have to you have to ask why at least why am i doing this i hate this why am i doing this <laughs> why are you making me do this and all that and you can explain and they have to either accept it or not
That's interesting what you said too earlier is that when coaches and athletes' goals and communication aligns, the athletes are actually less at injury risk because they're both on board with the <clears throat> with the same goals and program. Yeah, it's, I think it's um, I think it's really I, I don't know I don't know how any other way to do it. I, I just that's just maybe my coaching stuff, but you know I can't push a kid that doesn't want to be pushed. You know, and I have to know who that kid is. You know, there's a kid on the team right now. He likes to show up once in a while, and he just likes to hang out with there. You know, I can't push that kid. Uh, but there's another one in there that is at me all the time. Like, what can I do now? What can I do now? And I know I can do a lot more with them. Their results will be whatever they are, but, um, you know, it's it's just what the kids wanted to do. I mean, that's, that's all coaches should be there for is what their athletes are looking to get out of the program. And for me, I talk a lot. I like talking. I like talking with the kids. I like talk. I talk. I call the parents on the national team. I call every parent of every kid on the national team because there's kids that have don't know me from Adam, and they make the national team. I shake their hand when they get called up there. They look at me like I've never seen you before in my life, and now you're my coach for the national team, and they're scared because they're on the national team. They don't know what that means. So I spend a lot of time talking to the parents, like, how, what's what's this kid like? How do, how do they act? Or do they talk at home? Because, you know, I can do a phone call with them, but they don't really say much. Or are they nervous? Are they whatever it turns out to be? So I, I spend a lot of time talking to the club coaches and the, the uh, parents of the athletes on the national team so that when I go with them in training camp, I know something about them. I'll email the kids or Facebook them. They're always on Facebook, so I use Facebook a lot. They'll spend way more time explaining things to me on a Facebook message than they would if I did a Skype call with them. <laughs> yeah, very true. And, yeah. and, and at any time of the day, I'll send a message and say, hey, how's it going? It could be the middle of school, and I'll get a message five minutes back and say, yeah, doing good. Training's going fine. You know, a little tweak the little finger here, but I think it's fine. I got it checked out and all that. Great. Check in and we we'll are move on. Next time I see him at training camp, I say, hey, how's that finger going? That's very then they true. Know. You know, the biggest, the biggest thing that I realized this year in ARCO was how much influence coaches really have on their athletes and the little things that they do. And it was it's scary in some ways. You know, like it, it really is um, powerful for the coaches. That they have so much power. And I, I want to give some of that power back to the kids a little bit. So for example, I we had the speed climbing in Arco and we went to another town during the competition to, to do our training because we weren't going to get any practice runs at the actual event. So we went and did some practice runs. We took them. We had a lunch scheduled. It was really late. We hardly got time to eat it before we got on the bus. On the bus, I said, guys, kind of had the rush there. We didn't get what we want. But you know what? After the team meeting tonight, you seven, meet me at the gelato place on the corner. I'm going to buy you guys all gelato. And, uh, just before you guys. Because you guys worked really hard today. Whatever, you know. It's the same thing every other coach does a lot of times. So we meet there. I said, you don't have to come. I got there at 7 o'clock. Every one of them was standing there waiting. We had gelato. <laughs> we walked a little bit. They went to their cabins. Never thought anything of it. At the coaches' conference, Christy, who was doing the speed climbing, her dad is a gym owner, came up to me and said, thank you so much for taking my athlete out for ice cream. And like, I have... I don't even, I didn't even remember what it was. She said she came back. That was the one thing she remembered that the oh, wow. national team head coach took her, who she didn't think anyone even knew who she was, took her and the rest of the athletes for ice cream. And that was the best experience she had. And I was like, wow, you know, like it's so powerful what, uh, what people have. And it's just got to be aware of it, I think. You know, like the, the influence we have on these kids is pretty immense. And uh, it's a big responsibility, I think, for sure. So what do you think that the if coaches have such a large influence on these athletes, what would be, if there were to be one recommendation that you would tell coaches to, this is what you could do to prevent injuries in your athletes, or this is something you should be aware of? And you can only pick one. What would be yeah. the most important thing? Because I know your brain's filled with loads of it, especially yeah. after last week. But what would be the most important thing that you would want to share? To share with other coaches about injury prevention. Exactly. 
you know, I don't know. Yes, yeah, yeah, so much. I, I think the biggest thing, I've said it already, I think the biggest thing is, is to have a progression for every exercise or drill that you have in your book. So everything that you want these kids to do, there should be some kind of adaptive progression for those that aren't quite ready to do it that would allow them to be able to get to the point you want to get safely. I think we push the kids too hard, too fast. And I think that comes from the results-based performances that we're hoping for. The kids have to be in this ranking to move on to a next competition when we should be thinking about what is right for this kid at that time. And, it, and I, it's hard. You know, you got, you got a club that may be pushing up parents, pushing athletes, pushing you. It's hard for a, for a coach to rein an athlete back, but it might be the most important thing to do for their development as an uh, athlete for not just that season, but the season beyond. And, and really trust in your plan. Like, Tweak it as you need to. Of course, everyone does this, but really trust your plan that this is going to work and get that and share it. Sorry, I'm already not, I'm not saying one thing. Share it with the <laughs> athletes. The athletes need to buy into it, or else they uh, they're not they're not going to f- be able to uh, follow it. So so I, so to answer the first one there, I think it's progressions, exercises, and drills all have to have something that adapts them to every ability level that you have on your team. And then make sure it's okay that the kid knows they can do something a little less than everyone else, but they'll get there eventually. Because they won't want to. They'll see their peers doing something. Why can't I do that? And instead of saying you're not ready for it, which they aren't, you can have to say we need to see you build up this a little bit. When you can do this, we'll get you to the next level, and and you'll be fine. But put the work into this first, and you'll be good. Good. Well put. Well put. And then with the climbing warm up, we were talking a little about what you do for your warm up. It's actually an excellent warm up. Um, can you tell me a little about the progression, how you get your athletes warmed up, and, and what they do? Yeah, so for I mean, we it changes. I mean, this team in Camor that I'm working with now is this is the first year I'm working with this particular team, and I've had my own team in Bath for quite a few years. Um, so there's always different ways of doing it, and. Um, you know, what I've always believed is, you know, the body works better when it's warm, a degree Celsius. An increase in body temperature will start making all, you know, all the tendons glide more and the blood's flowing. Everything is good that way. So we do want to get that body temperature up just a tiny bit. After that, I, um, I like to, to, we do the, the dynamic stretching. We don't do any static. Um, the rotations will come in here. The thing that I do that in a lot of, I haven't seen a lot of other teams do, and I think it's just from my own personal um, experiences is that I never loved, liked getting onto the climbing wall full on with my feet on because the kids would go too hard at the start. And so what I would get them to do is to climb but with their feet on the ground. So they're still reaching for far moves. They can use a little bit smaller holes than they would if their feet were on on every, every angle. So they can kind of slowly warm up their fingers because they're they're hanging on their arms still with good posture so their their fingers are getting warmed up they are being stressed but they're just not being full body stressed and they would go around the gym and we would make games out of it we would say you know your feet are on the ground you have to move them like you would climbing you have to weight your feet and hands like you would but now we can do the most incredible moves possible so you see those little edges i want you to dino to that hold way over there fly through the air and they, and they would make ridiculous things they do you know, their feet are on the ground. So they would gear themselves up and they would fly. They do a three six in the air, latch the hold, <laughs> and then their feet are on the ground the whole time and then be like, yeah, and then they would just keep going. So we would do the most ridiculous moves possible, but like underclings that were right above our, our shoelaces or down by our knees, which, you know, we probably wouldn't be able to do. But because their feet are on the ground, they're not, they're not going to hurt themselves and they can do... You know, it's just more creative. It gets their mind going and and stuff like that as well. And then once they've done that a few times, then we get them on the wall and they can do their traverses and and that. And their fingers are way more warmed up than they used to be. Um, I use the finger flicks or whatever people call them um, just to get pumped up a little bit as well. 
That's a lot. I mean, kids kids don't like warming up. They, they think it's a waste of time, I think, a lot of times. And part of the education of a coach is to teach them why this is important. Because as they get older, they're not going to be as flexible. They're not going to warm up as fast. Even from 12 years old to 16 or 17, they're going to, like I'm, I'm in my 40s, right? So I take a long time to warm up or I, I, I use a long time to warm up. These kids need that as well too. And I think once you get those habits in there, it's so much easier to let that, that'll always happen when they get older. Good. So that understanding of why they're warming up. And then it sounds like, I mean, I've never heard of that before, but you make a cool game out of being able to well, uh, warm up. I, I, I think it's hilarious. You know, like, <laughs> I'm going and I have to lead them because the first time I do, my, <laughs> we do silly stuff. All right. And I always say to them, we're in the gym, the kids are self-conscious. And I said, if we all do this together, we're not the silly ones. Everyone else is not doing this. These guys are odd. We're the ones that are doing everything right. So, you know, they can look at us and they're probably like, they, they, they want to be with us. So we'll do this walk around. But I'll do, you know, lock off on a hold, pretend to chalk up, you know, <laughs> on there, locked off. I'll I'll make the same noises I do when I'm bouldering. So like, and lash a hold and then let my feet kind of swing underneath. And it's like, it's it's just easier, you know, it's fun. And and I'd say, do the most ridiculous thing. What what can you possibly do? And then kids will make it up. I don't know. It works for, the older the kids get, the less they make the noises and be ridiculous. But the younger kids really like that. And, and those, those are the younger kids are the hardest ones to get to warm up. So, they're, yeah. and this, so this works for them. Yeah, and the other kids realize that they're they're stretching at the same time. You know, they're getting the body, and, and but they have to do it. Like they're on their toes, they're engaging their core, they're weighting their feet, they're hanging off their arms in a manner that's broke. They can do their lock offs. They can hold on to slopers that they may not normally be able to. They can, you know, do amazing rose moves. They can match underclings that they normally wouldn't. All these things are putting some, you know some stretch on all their muscles and their body is getting warmed up. So I don't know. I, it works for us. I don't yeah. know. <laughs> well, I'm going to, I'm going to try that next time. Yeah, <laughs> on myself. It, we should probably do like video who can do the best warm up with their feet on the ground, like the most ridiculous moves. I mean, and we get kids that are, you know, do three sixties or they go in and they get like a mono on something or they're not waiting yet, but they'll like stand up. And it's like, look, I got this mono. And, and, uh, Whatever it is, you'll, you'll have plenty of YouTube videos. Uh, yeah, the, it, it, we'll just make sure the camera doesn't see that their feet are on the ground the whole time. And then yeah, it has just, to be uh, like trick camera angles. And right. then you just move the camera down and yeah. realize that people have been standing on the ground the whole time. So, mm -hmm. any kind of last minute thoughts on the topic of preventing or rehabilitating, rehabilitating injuries, um, especially for for climbing teams or for youth? Any any last things that you didn't mention? That yeah. You think? I think the biggest thing for athletes to know is that if they deal with their any kind of tweaks or injuries, re, regardless if they think it's serious or not, if they deal with that immediately and get it checked out as soon as possible and do whatever's required to rest that after, whether it's a week or two or maybe it's maybe they're fine, to really to hold on to it. So if they need to be off for two weeks, they're off for two weeks because the problem is if they go back too early, now it's not two weeks. Now it's four weeks. And if they go back too early there, now we're talking months. And when we have a season, all those those weeks add up to no training anymore. So those goals that they established at the start uh, are not realistic. So athletes have to uh, – I think they're afraid to say they're injured because they, then they can't climb. But that, Because they're right. They, they shouldn't climb at that point. But it's better to do that and take the two weeks off than it is to take the three months off. That may happen because they just didn't pay any attention to it. So I think that's the key thing. The other thing for coaches, they have to enforce this. And if the kids can't make the right decisions for themselves, that's where the coach has to step in and says, I'm making this decision for you now. And it's not easy. But coaching isn't about making easy decisions sometimes. You know, we're dealing with kids that have growth plates that are being still worked on and, you know, uh, whatever is going on in their body. You know, it, it's a big responsibility for us as coaches to get them through these these puberty years intact 
and able to come out the other end and do whatever they want. So sacrificing a little result at that stage for the results further down the road is, is the way that I think coaches need to go. Excellent. Well said. There's, yeah, thanks for doing the interview. There's just a lot yeah, of really good information in there, I think. Um, well, I like to talk, so anytime. I yeah. Don't, and I love this. Um, you have the same passion as I do about climbing. I mean, we got to be careful, the two and you, you and I together, sometime we may never get out of the room. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Grab a beer and uh, have a six hour conversation. <laughs> yeah, I might need more than one. So. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, that's great. Awesome. So yeah, I'll kind of compile this all together. Um, I'm gonna pull out, you know, some. There's some, I kind of time mark some some of the great parts mm -hmm. as well, some quotes, and I'll send you them just so you can you know confirm them or if you need to sure. you know, alter them at all. But um, yeah, it's great. A lot of really good information. I learned a lot too, just kind of cool. li listening yeah. to listening to you. So it's good. Thanks. Well, I love it. This is this is what I do. So I'm hoping to do it for a lot more years and having your information. And just to let you know, we've been incorporating the warm up um, with the team. I haven't had a practice with the team uh, to really introduce us, but one of the other coaches has. And with my adult training program that I had started last night, I did this as well. And um, everyone's everyone thinks it's pretty cool. You know, like I think it's a real. Uh, I don't know. It seems so natural. Like everything else I do in sport, I always try to say, what is it going to do for my climbing? Like uh, if we get athletes, we're going to do this because it'll help you as a climber. And this is just so much more specific of a climbing warm up than we've ever done. You know, everyone does the forearm stretches and they do this. So um, we're going to post this up on our board here at the gym and have a, little, a few clinics just around the warm up. Uh, just to, to do it, Kate and I, uh, just to show people what it is. And I, I'd be curious to see uh, the, the comments that come out of that. I'll be sure to pass them on to you as well, too. For sure, for sure. Yeah, it's, um, mm -hmm. you know, spread the knowledge. It's The whole mm -hmm. goal is to keep, you know, climbers well, your It's nice of you that you're so willing to do it. Some people kind of keep it too close to themselves and uh, don't get the information out um, as much you know, maybe because they want to do clinics themselves and stuff like that. So I appreciate you being so open on it. For sure. All right. Well, yeah. have have a good trip. Pack up. Yeah. And, thanks. Uh, yeah. 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 Sounds exciting. I've just been eating donuts lately because I think I need an extra <laughs> layer of fat to help out with that surfing that I'm going to probably be doing. So get some buoyancy. <laughs> Yeah, well, just uh, keep the internal heat up a little bit. I'll, I'll have to talk to Kelly, her dietitian, about that. So yeah, about yeah. chocolate milk and donuts. Chocolate milk and donuts all the way. Yeah. All right. Take care, Chris. <laughs> Thanks, Jared. We'll talk to you hopefully soon. I'll, I'll keep in touch for sure and uh, have a good weekend.